All right, I'm sorry about the headline. I just needed to get you to click the video in the first place. But the reality is we are here to talk about Arsenal. We're here to talk about the PR problem that this team currently have. And I believe it's more of a PR problem than an actual tactical problem. Though some of you may disagree. There will be some people in the comments who have their own individual ideas around what could be better about Arsenal. And believe me, I think every team has areas that they can improve. There is not one side that played in the Champions League this evening who didn't have an area that they could improve. We're even looking at Real Madrid, who, by the way, still sit one point behind Arsenal in this Champions League table. So whilst everyone's busy talking about all the negatives, and I've watched a lot of fan videos, I've watched a lot of people who are using it to needle at Arteta and Arsenal and say they were right along, whatever it is, there are some things we need to address. Because the narrative around Arsenal could be the thing that decides a huge amount of what goes on at this club in the near future, rather than the reality let's break that down a little bit. The reality here is that just three years ago, Arsenal were sitting on 60-something points outside the top four in the Premier League, looking rather hopeless in terms of their future, and still just emerging out of the banter club era, marginally still on the cusp of being sucked back into that era. The reality now is that they live rather a luxurious lifestyle, taking luxurious trips in the Champions League, places such as PSG, or welcoming the people such as PSG. They also play... Teams such as Shakhtar Donetsk, a side who are very difficult to play in the Champions League, and other sides have also found that. Not only because, of course, they are a very difficult team to play, very well coached in the first place, and a lot of technical, brilliant players who have a good place to play their trade, but they're also playing for a place which, at the moment, feels under threat and is very much having a strong narrative built around it itself. Very different to the plight of Arsenal right now. But taking that to another stadium, taking the political uh, comings and goings of that area, sometimes it can kind of have a little bit of an effect on the opposition. I'm not saying that that's the reason that Arsenal went easy this evening. I definitely don't think they did. But it can have a mental effect. And I think the mental effect is a big part of what I want to discuss here. I'm not here to give you... 10 different stats about Arsenal, though I can give you a couple here. It has been quite a while since they have lost even in the Champions League group stages or this new stage here. It's difficult to know, it's difficult to gauge how well they're doing in this new Champions League, mainly because you don't know how long it's going to take to play out, you don't know when teams are going to hit certain gears, you don't know which teams are going to end up playing which teams later on and therefore re-emerging. It's made the Champions League more interesting, but it's also made Arsenal a little more difficult to judge. If Arsenal were at seven points in their own group right Right now, they'd probably be halfway home and hosed in what was going on, and the narrative would be a lot better. In fact, they'd even be looking at, hey, who can we rest in these next couple of games? Who can we take forward and just, you know, not worry too much about? But that's not the way of the new Champions League. And I'm all for it. It's a brand new format. It works really well. It's enjoyable to watch, etc. etc. I watch tonight much more invested than I would even last season. Don't want to miss a night of the Champions League, right? Not the point though. Arsenal and Arteta's job in recent years has been twofold. First of all, reinvigorate the club in terms of the narrative and the idea of itself. And it's certainly done that, though there are still fragile elements to that. The other one was to reinstill a winning culture which felt a lot more difficult to disrupt than the previous one that they had built. It is very difficult to the Ar Arsene Wenger era, though we still find Arsene Wenger uh, quotes on the walls, though we still see that there are a lot of ripple effects from that era, such as the stadium, such as the finance, financial stability, same uh, shape of owners, different face to those. This is a very different task now for Arteta. He has to be Mr. Consistent in order to beat anyone else in this league, either Liverpool or Man City, and possibly even some other people in there. But name me one manager this season that has actually played exciting football. There are very few, you know, put all the cards on the table, let's see what happens down the river kind of managers out there in the modern world now, which is why Liverpool felt so wedded to the likes of Jurgen Klopp, which is why there are people at Barcelona right now who feel very lucky to have a new manager, which is why people feel lucky to have even a Carlo Ancelotti, who, by the way, isn't even that manager who sees what's happening, what's happening on the river here. He is very different to any of these managers. They're, they're, these are very rare types of managers, right? And Arsenal have a diamond. He's not even in the rough anymore. Maybe in the past you could have been, you said it was in the rough, but it's not. But he is 
not even risk averse. He is a risk reducing manager right now who is playing without some of his key players in Odegaard, obviously in William Sleeper on the weekend and frankly without Calafiori probably on the weekend now, though obviously in the big games you hope to see a lot of these good players. The point is... I saw a lot of fan cams, I've seen a lot of articles, I've seen a lot of people building this idea that somehow this is not good enough for Arsenal right now. And I don't know whether there is an entitled nature to some of these Arsenal fans or whether it's that there is an ego-driven reaction to what everyone else is currently saying to them, which is, well, actually, we do play rather beautiful football. Because in recent years, they've been used to being excited and invigorated by this Arsenal team, a team who has come back late, a team who has had exciting, young, driven attackers who are able to just get out there and get out the opposition. Frankly, I think some of those opposition have worked out how to reduce some of Arsenal's risk. Fair enough. I think a lot of uh, people are going to get worked out at some point in their career. You can't really level that as a fault at Mikel Arteta. But at the same time, it's come at probably the worst time for Arsenal. A time when they're missing one of their creative driving forces. They're trying to bed in Marino. They're trying to bed in Calafiori. They're trying to get a new shape to this midfield. And they're trying to find new ways to crack the opposition. Tonight being another one of those examples. But it's not as if, again, we didn't see more dominance from Arsenal. The problem was that the narrative, the way that it goes in the media is, oh, they only just won 1-0. And late on, the plucky underdog came back and almost changed what it was. Frankly, I don't think that's going to impact Arsenal internally at the club all that much right now. I said this in the previous video and I'll say it again. At the start of the season, the stats guys will walk into a room and say, we are estimated to get this many points in the Premier League. And obviously that will change throughout the season. But we're estimating we're going to get this many points in the Premier League. We'll get this many points in the Champions League. And this is where we think are reasonable goals to set for this season. Mikel Arteta is going to turn around and say, I want to win the Champions League. I want to win the Premier League and I want to win this. There is no reason why a manager wouldn't set that out at the start of the season. There's no reason why he wouldn't set that out for his players at the start of the season. These are all highly driven, very different individuals on a day-to-day -day basis than the people that live our lives collectively, right? These are people who have a lot of other things, uh, privileges, but also a lot of other things that drive them, take them further in these kind of careers, right? It doesn't make them special, just makes them different. On top of that, we will then see that there are a lot of people outside of the club who think that every result is somehow a surprise to Arsenal. That when every manager goes into a game, he expects to win it 3-0, that he doesn't highlight some of the drawbacks of his own side and the things that his own team needs to protect, and that he doesn't highlight some of the strengths of the opposition and some of the areas that they need to attack. 3-0... 8-0, whatever it is, is the prediction of your team because they're just as hyped as you are. The reality is not the same. The reality here is that Arsenal walk into every match with a very good idea of how it's going to play out in the first place. In fact, it almost begins to feel scripted after a while when you look at some of the high-end teams and the way that they play their football. I want to believe that this is a beautiful fairy tale of a journey as much as you do. But we both know that the teams at the top of the Premier League are the teams that are best at ensuring and minimising the risk. And the fact is that whilst everyone is bitching and moaning about how Arsenal play their football, trying to, because by the way, we're now familiar and familiarity breeds contempt with people like uh, Mikel Arteta, we're now familiar with him, we're going to find any fault in that armour because it's not possible to get at him through results. Broadly, like he said in his own press conference, they hadn't lost in six months. So they're going to have to go another six months now without a loss. Before that, by the way, Arsenal fans were discussing invincibility. But for some weird reason, because losing to Bournemouth dints that invincibility, they are somehow so fallible now that they weren't going to win anything this season. Despite the fallibilities of Man City, which, by the way, are highly evident, and the fallibilities of Liverpool that have so far, I think even Arne Slot knows, been to an extent papered over. And so what we're doing now is creating a narrative, a false narrative, based on a weird outcome of all this Arsenal team, which basically says, oh, well, you know, they're not going to win anything because we're disappointed in the short term. And the short term is the same as the long term. And if we feel this way now, then really what we should do is move on to another manager. There is Arteta out for some weird reason trending on Twitter. Not that I'm saying that comes from Arsenal fans. I understand people from outside the Arsenal setup can make that kind of thing trend. But the point still follows. The pressure begins to build. Not that I think Arsenal overly pay attention to that, but once the fans inside the stadium start to go, well, 
it is a little bit repetitive. It can be a little bit boring the way that they win. That's not our identity right now. We don't feel comfortable. We don't really, we feel a way about supporting this kind of football. Then it begins to eat away at people. Players begin to get their egos uh, bashed. People begin to get annoyed by some of the results. And suddenly we're looking at a situation where there is a weird level of pressure. And what is it about best laid plans? Those begin to go out of the window. The pressure begins to build. Arsenal have ridden those kind of waves before. They've ridden out those storms. And frankly, I think they've been justified in doing that. We've seen the ridiculousness in the Prime documentary, The All or Nothing, where they were speaking about, oh, he needs to go now, blah, blah, blah. There are clubs that seem to care more about, you know, the results and care more about what we actually see is happening on the field rather than, oh, this guy missed a penalty or this guy got sent off, whatever. Loads of Arsenal's result this season, almost all of them, or the negative ones, have been down to rag cards, which have massively changed the game. And whether you subscribe to a conspiracy theory or not is almost irrelevant to my argument here. I, I didn't understand the argument on the weekend from Gary Neville saying, uh, oh, they should have won the game anyway. I wasn't quite sure how he justified it. I wasn't, I, I thought his logic was pretty flawed as to, oh, you have to be winning that game anyway. Sure, it's easy to say those things afterwards. It's certainly easy to say those things when you come from an era of football where a lot more of it was about your boys or beat our boys or our boys or beat your boys. That is a very different style of football and a very different brief from a lot of managers. But the point still stands. It's very relevant to the Shakhtar Donetsk game. This is a team who will have known tonight that was going to be more difficult than was going to be laid out for them. That everyone's headlines were going to be about the difference in spend, the difference in narrative, the difference in luxuries, the difference in all those things. And that the only way, they, the only real thing that can happen here, the only real headline is that they can lose. And of course, it becomes a lot easier to criticize this side once you point out the fallibilities, the vulnerabilities of this team, because suddenly that seems to be all you're looking for. There are elements of this in everyone's relationship with every football team, with a lot of individuals around them in their lives. As soon as one of your, of your friends points out, have you ever noticed that weird thing about that guy's hair? Have you ever noticed the weird thing that this guy on YouTube waves his hands around all the time and overmakes points? Suddenly it's all that you can see. And that, to an extent, gets in the way of the romance, the relationship that you're feeling with your own club, right? Like, you really enjoy watching Saka. You really enjoy watching Odegaard. You really enjoy that Havertz is not a conventional striker. You enjoy that Marino is going to be taking up this brand new role, or Rice is some kind of unknowable six that you will unlock at some point this season, or Martinelli is way more charismatic than any of us know, and you're going to show it in a couple of games here. But it's changed the nature of supporting a football team. You become almost a PR guy for half these people. And suddenly you're in a situation where you're doing PR rather than enjoying the actual nuances of what's happening for the game. It's become part of modern support of any body, person, you know, set of people, right? Because there is always going to be an opposite argument. I'm going to lay out a video tomorrow on my main channel about how narrative is going to impact Arsenal this season and how even if they were flying high, similar to the way that Liverpool are flying right now, flying, there would be a whole other narrative and an alternative universe that loads of these other people would live in about spend, about uh, how this is actually down to Pep, about how this is actually down to someone else, about how we owe whatever it is to someone else, about how you can undermine half of this because it's a boring way of winning or because they're too open or because any of these kind of things, right? Because that was always going to be the way with Arsenal, because that will always be the way with the way that this Arsenal team is set up right now, because people know it gets clicked. It doesn't make it real, but it does mean that it becomes more perpetuated and it becomes the story that which is told. That is, that broadly, that's a reflection on the way that the Shakhtar game went tonight. I, I would say, I, I guess it's not advice to Arsenal fans, but it's kind of a, why would you support your team in that way? A genuine question, why would you support your team in that way? It doesn't create any positivity around the side. And I'll finish on this story. There's a study which always stuck with me. There was a box of rats that was labeled intelligent rats. And there was a box of rats that was labeled normal rats. And there were multiple studies done around if you brought people into a room and showed them there was a box of intelligent rats and a box of normal rats 
and they treated the intelligent rats even slightly differently to the normal rats. Those intelligent, by the way, exactly the same set of rats split randomly between both boxes, would perform better in the tasks that they were set, say, solving a maze, say, trying to find the cheese, wherever it is. And there wasn't, it didn't feel like there was an explanation. It didn't feel like there was much to it. And I can't, ex I can't explain that. I'm not a scientist, clearly. But the same for me goes in football. If you walk into a stadium or a collection of people walk into a stadium and say, oh, these are just the normal rats. This is, we're now familiar. That becomes a problem for your team. You begin to believe that the magic is draining from your side, whether you believe it or not, whether it's a conscious thing or not. You begin to get further away from the success of that FA Cup and you begin to get closer towards, oh, it's a few years since we won X. Oh, did the FA Cup really mean that much anyway? There's a rewriting of history over here, even though back then it felt so fantastic, it felt so hopeful. There is suddenly this narrative of, well, if he hasn't won it now, is he going to be able to keep the players on side? Despite the fact that this being the third big, like, you know, high intensity season, really we should have expected a bit of a drop off for this Arsenal team anyway. But no, that, like, we just can't go with that. That's not going to run. It must be an, a terminal drop-off within this team. It can't be that they're trying to bed new people in, that some people are going to have injury seasons, that some people are going to be a little bit off. It has to be that this is a, a permanent state, in a, even though the universe is ever in flux around this Arsenal side. And the way that you judge the rats suddenly seeps into every other aspect. And then we'll react to that. This team, I, I know this from being at the Emirates, from being at Anfield, from being at Old Trafford, you can see it. The teams begin to become a reflection of those things. And it becomes very hard to mentally overcome the hurdles, which before, when momentum was there, when belief was there, felt very different. And I would just guard against that. I don't have a permanent fix, but I would certainly guard against the beginning of that terminal decline because I think it would be very easy, easy to label it a brand new manager such as Mikel Arteta. He hasn't done this before. He's not the same as Pep. He isn't able to re-up this team. This team is too similar. This X is underachieved. This guy is the, the issue here. There are already those things rough, rustling around, right? So I'd love to know what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know. And, you know, maybe there is a debate there to be had around this Arsenal side. Maybe you do think that there is a disappointing element to them. But for some weird reason, why are you painting that as a permanent state when we know for a fact that that is not true and that this is a very high-achieving Arsenal team who are surrounded by high achievers in their peers and other clubs? Chat to you guys in a while. Much love. Bye.